Hi there, everyone. I'm really grateful today to be speaking about participation predictors for leisure time physical activity intervention in children with cerebral palsy, our new paper published in Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. I'd like to thank DMCN for inviting this author video podcast and also acknowledge all of my co-authors. The University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners and their custodianship on the lands on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. As we know, children and adults with cerebral palsy participate less often and are less involved in physical activities in the community. They have high levels of sedentary behaviour, so that's time spent sitting down and lying down. They also have low levels of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity, with the caveat that that's if they have significant activity limitations, so classified in gym FCS levels, three, four, and five. A number of systematic reviews, including my own published in DMCN in 2017, have concluded that skills-focused interventions, so those that only address activity limitations and body structures and functions, when used alone, don't improve participation in physical activities or amount of habitual physical activity in the short term and at a clinically meaningful level. So if skills or activity capacity doesn't then explain the relationship between um, that and physical activity, what else explains physical activity health behaviours? When we ask people with disability and people with cerebral palsy and their families, they tell us that there are many other barriers to physical activity participation, including things like policies, their emotions and beliefs, self-efficacy, mental health, lack of access to assistive technology, financial resources, lack of inclusion, preferences, motivation, family functioning, availability of activities and knowledge of what's available. This is what I call the activity competence cone of shame when we forget or don't address these other barriers to participation. One thing I'd like to review um, for the purposes of explaining the results of this paper is something called self-determination theory. When we were thinking about physical activity um, barriers and the fact that many of these barriers are actually behavioral barriers in nature and that physical activity itself is a health behavior, we thought that we needed to explore some more concepts related to human behavior and motivation. Humans have a basic tendency towards growth and positive motivation. People do stuff for reasons, of course, but not all of those reasons are externally mediated. So not all of those reasons are because we get rewarded to do something or because we get punished if we don't. People actually have an inner drive to achieve things and continue behaviors. And this is something posited by Richard Ryan and Edward Deasy in self-determination theory. Something that sits under SDT is basic psychological needs theory. Richard Ryan and Edward L. DC posited that we have three basic psychological needs, that being autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And you can see their meanings here. Self-determination theory says that when these basic psychological needs are met, autonomy, competence, and relatedness are fulfilled, that leads to our well-being and also intrinsically motivated pursuit of goals. There is a continuum of motivation from a motivation through to intrinsic motivation. You can be not motivated by anything, non-regulation. You can be extrinsically motivated to do something, which means that uh, basically in a simplified way, you have rewards and punishments, or um, when you go towards more intrinsically motivated, that you align, you value something, or it aligns with what you believe to fully intrinsic motivation, which means that you're doing things for interest, enjoyment, inherent satisfaction, um, or social connectedness. Those in more intrinsic types of motivation, or perhaps those that um, integrated regulation or identified regulation you can see there, are more likely to continue a behavior. Um, if you've got those types of motivations, you're more likely to pursue or achieve goals related to that behavior, and you're less likely to have your motivation undermined. So to summarize, physical activity is a health behavior. So some other examples might be diet choices or smoking. 
Self-determination theory says that when we fulfill our basic psychological needs of autonomy, competence, and, relation, and relatedness, that leads to intrinsic motivation to pursue our goals. And those intrinsic types of motivation are much more powerful and they work better than rewards and punishments. And in fact, rewards and punishments can undermine our intrinsic motivation to do things. So we went ahead and designed a physical activity intervention for children with CP that was based on this underlying premise of self-determination theory. We wanted it to be goal-directed and collaborative, family-centered, ecological and context-focused in the context of the child, not in the clinic, and that it would be individualized, tailored and multimodal. Participate CP was supposed to build intrinsic motivation for physical activity goals by supporting autonomy, competence, and relatedness. It was supposed to be goal-directed and reduce modifiable barriers to participation. This was done by addressing environmental, contextual barriers in addition to skills, if that was required. But we wanted to know why does it work? And moreover, does that underlying theoretical premise of self-determination theory actually hold? We measured Canadian Occupational Performance Measure, performance and satisfaction for those overarching participation goals. We measured belief in goal self-competence, which is how confident children and their families were that they would achieve their goals. And we also measured average minutes per day of moderate to vigorous physical activity using accelerometry. We picked a number of variables that we would use as predictors um, to look at the response to intervention. So what we wanted to know is, do these predictive variables, which reflect those um, constructs associated with self-determination theory, actually explain how well the intervention works? So in theory, for example, children that are more intrinsically motivated for physical activity might respond better to the intervention. So they have a, a more a higher increase in their um, performance. Or if we actually address all of those uh, incremented treatment goals, so for example, things that are the child and family's barriers to participation, does that also predict a re increased response to the intervention? So the more and goals that are addressed and the better that we address them, does the child do better? Similarly, we wanted to know whether or not there was an effect of gross motor function, whether or not um, autism spectrum disorder was also related to response to intervention and also whether there was an effective age, so younger children um, or older children doing better or worse. This is what we found. We found that children who achieved more process goals set during the treatment phase had a greater increase in their CRPM goal performance. So if that, um, if that was that a participation goal is bike riding with friends at the park on the CRPM, a process goal that was set on the goal attainment scaling might be riding a bike without training wheels 100 metres in a straight line, which of course reflects activity capacity. So those children that um, had more of those process goals achieved that reflected barriers to participation had a greater increase in their um, COPM goal performance, which is exactly how we thought that the treatment would work. The better that we addressed the barriers to participation, the better that we would address participation, which makes sense. We found that children who were more intrinsically motivated for physical activity at baseline also responded better to the intervention in terms of their satisfaction of goal performance. So you can see that these um, children who had a higher score in interest, enjoyment, motivation for physical activity at baseline had a greater increase in their satisfaction um, from pre-intervention. So this also makes sense because it shows that um, children who are more intrinsically motivated, um, who, who um, already really like to do physical activity, this was an intervention that was highly targeted to their style of motivation. Um, and they really responded excellently to the intervention. However, as you can see, most children had a clinically significant effect on COPM satisfaction. So even children that didn't have um, very high levels of interest, enjoyment, motivation for physical activity, still had a base level clinically significant effect. We also found that children with high competence related motivation for physical activity were highly confident and remain so, and this didn't affect their goal confidence. Those children who had low confidence and motivation for physical activity are those who improved their goal confidence the most. 
The reason that we see this um, relationship, which might um, be the opposite of what you might expect, is because children were actually very, very confident that they would achieve their goals at the beginning of the intervention. So there was a bit of a stealing effect on the belief in goal, co- uh, goal self-confidence scale. But for those children who had very low confidence at the beginning, um, and they also had very um, low confidence-related motivation so that they they didn't really identify that they wanted to do physical activities because they would get better at them. In fact, they probably had quite low self-efficacy. Those children actually improved the most, showing that participate CP is actually highly relevant for children who have low levels of self-efficacy, low levels of confidence, and uh, in their ability to do physical activity and low motivation that is related to how much they would like to improve their ability to do physical activity, which shows that the intervention is tar- should be targeted directly towards those who need it most. Other interesting findings that um, showed an attenuated response to the intervention, so children who actually did worse, were those who were older, so older age predicted um, a reduced response to the intervention. And also a comorbid diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder also predicted a reduced response to the intervention. And that was about a third of participants in the trial. Predictors of moderate to vigorous physical activity performance were a little bit more tricky. That's because moderate to vigorous physical activity was actually very high on average at baseline. Parental autonomy supportiveness, interestingly, seemed to have the opposite effect on change in moderate to vigorous physical activity than predicted. This is probably because of the effect of a small sample and also ceiling effects. Extrinsic motivation for physical activity, so you can see here that's um, MPAMR appearance motivation, predicted an attenuated increase as expected. So those who were um, interested in physical activity because of extrinsic motivation reasons um, didn't do so well in the intervention. Some take home messages are here. We need to change the way that we think about physical activity behaviors in children with CP, because this could help us to design more effective intervention programs. Ideally, we need to think of um, children and their families with CP as people who are subject to the same sorts of motivations as everybody else. And self-determination theory is a really good way to explain how children with CP and their families are motivated to do physical activity and also how an intervention might work to it to improve their participation in physical activity. Higher levels of intrinsic motivation for physical activity at baseline predicted a better response to a participation-focused intervention that was based on self-determination theory. Children who had low levels of competence-related motivation for physical activity improved their confidence to achieve their physical activity goals the most. And that suggests an effect of having positive affirming physical activity experiences. The more positive experiences that you have, that affirms your self-efficacy and it helps to improve your confidence. Children with CP who are older or have a diagnosis of ASD may need additional tailored support, such as needing more extrinsic types of motivation for physical activity, which is not what we expected, but is really highly relevant and has been shown in other studies, in um, particularly in children with a diagnosis of ASD. And A great takeaway that helps um, solidify our understanding of how the intervention um, works is that the more barriers that were addressed in the intervention process, the greater the increase in physical activity participation, showing that addressing those barriers to participation really does help improve participation. I'd like to thank you again and thank DMCM for the opportunity for this author podcast. Bye now.